My name is Phil Huff, and I have the distinct pleasure to introduce Doug Scott to you all, which seems almost redundant. Hopefully, almost everybody in the room knows Doug Scott. His name is synonymous with wilderness. But there are some young faces in the crowd who might not. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about my experience with Doug as a friend, as a mentor, as someone who's inspired me over the last 10 years to do more and better things for wilderness and wilderness advocacy. I met Doug at the Wilderness Mentoring Conference nine and a half years ago when he was holding court by the pool with a copy of his book, The Enduring Wilderness. There were a few of us sitting around absolutely enthralled with every word, not really quite sure where it was leading, but I took the book, read through, went back to North Idaho, and began to use it as a guide for our campaign. And I would attribute most of the success that we've had in advocating for the Scotchman Peaks to the words Doug wrote in that book. He's a tremendous resource to our community. On a trip later that fall to Troy, Libby, and Heron, Montana, places where we not only have wilderness supporters like here, we have wilderness skeptics. Doug was able to address those crowds in a way that very few people can. He was able to take folks who weren't quite sure what this wilderness thing was about and posing some hard questions and turn them around to where they would give us a hearing and even lend their support in later years. Remarkable that way, as we're driving around from community to community, Doug's pulling tattered copies of 26-year-old articles out of his briefcase to show me what someone had written in the Spokesman Review. Words that still ring true today, busting myths about wilderness. He was able to quote verbatim testimony given in field hearings during the 1970s when Idaho was considering its last wilderness bill and told me the story about how he burned an effigy next to Frank Church in Grangeville. I can only imagine with his passion and fire in his soul, he burned even brighter than Frank. <laughs> Certainly there were skeptics there he hadn't convinced. But today you go to central Idaho, and while skeptics do remain, the conversation has changed. We heard from the panel earlier about some of that conversation, and we can argue that merits of collaboration and how to build consensus, but the conversation has changed both in central Idaho and northern Idaho where I work in northwestern Montana. Across our region and across our nation, we're seeing progress on wilderness bills and we're seeing that progress as a result of Doug and folks like him who can impart their knowledge, wisdom, and passion. Again, I go back to the Enduring Wilderness, the seminal book I gave to a wilderness ranger who spoke at our 50th celebration a week ago and wanted to know about the history of the Forest Service and its role in wilderness. I pointed him to Doug Scott. Today, we could do no better than to look to Doug Scott again for words of wisdom. For those of you who haven't followed his career, Doug has worked since the mid-1960s on the passage of nearly every major wilderness bill as either an employee of the Wilderness Society, the Sierra Club, the Campaign for America's Wilderness, an arm of the Pew Charitable Trusts, has authored another book, Wilderness, Our Uncommon Ground, and has one coming out here in just a few weeks that will trace the writings of wilderness history. He's a valuable resource to us all, and uh, I'm anxious to hear what he has to say today. Thank you, Doug. Phil, and there's, uh, I guess we have to make a certain allowance for exaggeration. Uh, I want to say, uh, one, I did not write the Wilderness Act. Two, I wasn't there when it was signed. I didn't sign it. Uh, and, uh, but I had the great good fortune to turn on my microphone. <laughs> I had the great good fortune to turn off my microphone. Ah, how's that? No. Oh, how's that? Too much, good. Um, 
so I want to talk today about wilderness history, but in the context, and particularly for the younger people who I'm so pleased to see here, uh, about the lessons that we can draw. We simply are not going to wait. You're not going to stand to wait for another 31 years to see wilderness designated in Montana or northern Idaho. I dare say you're going to see some before the end of this year in the, in the uh, test, John Tester's wonderful bill. What I want to start with is to say that every wilderness law, bar none, starts with someone who has a passion for, who is literally in love with a special place of wild land that they know and have explored. That is the fuel. Then they begin to reach out, they get with uh, agency people and see if they can find a, a friendly and a supportive agency folks to help. They get around the kitchen table to draw maps with magic markers with other people and say uh, we need to go up the left branch of the North Fork to uh, check out where the boundaries ought to be and what the values are. Um, there's no finer exemplar that we can talk to, talk about in Montana than Cecil Garland, ace hardware dealer in Lincoln hardly a hotbed of wilderness support in the uh, years immediately after the Wilderness Act uh, became law. And uh, Cecil got wind that the Forest Service had uh, cooked up a plan to uh, log, road and log, up in uh, his favorite hunting country, right up outside of Lincoln, in the scapegoat, Lincoln scapegoat backcountry. And he said, classic way that people do, he said, the hell, not going to happen. And before he was done, Cecil had drawn that map, gone to Washington, befriended the curmudgeonly old, intensely powerful chairman of the House Committee, and all the Montana delegation, of course. And uh, he was just an awesome advocate and before he was done, all exactly his map was designated by Congress uh, in 1972. It was the first wilderness area that was not on land required to be studied under the Wilderness Act, the so-called de facto wilderness. Extraordinarily important for uh, the future of our, uh, of our movement. Um, and uh, I love the anecdote that one night uh, Cecil ran into Congressman uh, Aspinall, the chairman of the committee, just at dusk on the Capitol grounds, and uh, Aspinall uh, observed that Cecil had one powerful senator. And it turns out that at the behest of Lee Metcalf, who was the Senate sponsor of this bill, Mike Mansfield, whose center we are uh, being hosted by, uh, Mike Mansfield just took every bill that came out of the House Interior Committee uh, that Aspinall wanted and stuffed them in his bottom drawer and figured that sooner or later the phone would ring. And Aspinall said, that's one powerful senator you had. Well, uh, much can be said to the detriment of the Forest Service uh, in some of the episodes in the history that I'll recite, but nothing can be said against their leadership. In 1924, following the, uh, the leadership of Aldo Leopold, then a uh, official in the regional office in Albuquerque, designating the world's first wilderness area, a real wild place with a real boundary map, protected by an administrative order signed with the uh, stroke of a pen by the regional forester, 1924. The idea caught on. It seemed like a good idea to a lot of other people in the Forest Service in that era. And pretty soon there were, uh, by, by 1939, there were about 72 Forest Service wilderness areas across the West. And uh, the uh, popular idea. Um, the force behind that was the director of the Recreation Division in the Chief's office, Bob Marshall. Somebody described him as the single greatest instrument for wilderness preservation that there ever was. That was quite accurate. Bob was famous for his 50-mile hikes. He came to dinner one time at, uh, when Stuart Brandborg was a young man down in Hamilton, down in Darby, and he didn't come up the, up the driveway. 
he came over the Selway Bitterroot Wilderness to uh, come to dinner. Uh, and Brandy still has the table, sort of like, you know, being in the Vatican, uh, has the table at which the, uh, that uh, Bob had, uh, had that dinner. Unfortunately, the problem with those lines that were established by administrative order by the stroke of a pen was that the same pen, or that pen in a different hand, could just as easily undo it and change those boundaries. And that wasn't theoretical. It started happening with great rapidity. Somebody decided they wanted to punch a completely unnecessary, an unused road, I've driven it, across uh, and segment, chop off a chunk of the uh, Gila wilderness, Aldo Leopold's wilderness. Went right through. Somebody decided in the 50s to lop 53,000 acres of old growth forest off the Three Sisters wilderness in uh, east of Eugene, Oregon, um, because some timber beast lusted after it. Out it came. So the problem was that the boundary lines were not sacrosanct, they kept moving. And that was the fundamental imp, uh, force impelling the Wilderness Act. And again, not theoretical. Over the 25 years from 1940 to the day the Wilderness Act was signed, the acreage of wilderness on the national forests increased by 2%. But that was net 2%. They kept slashing out the big trees and ramping up the rocks and ice. Dave Brower called it wilderness, uh, the wilderness cocktail, wilderness on the rocks. And th there went the biological diversity that was so vital a point uh, to uh, wilderness advocates. The National Park Service was causing the same kind of trouble uh, that the Forest Service leadership was, and this was the leaders, not most of the, of the workers. Um, in 1945, Howard Zonizer became the executive director of the Wilderness Society at the same time that David Brower became the executive director of the Sierra Club, and they were a wonderful team. And they just said, we can't cope with this. We're just going to have to deal with the fact that uh, we've, uh, we've got uh, uh, to make these lines stay put. Um, in 1947, Zonizer, two years into his tenure as the leader of the Wilderness Society, was tasked by the governing board of the Wilderness Society at their annual meeting to develop the concept of a wilderness law to make the line stay put. And this was an extraordinary burden to put on someone. First of all, he had to invent what the content of such a law would be. And secondly, he had to figure out how the hell to pass it in the deeply conservative and sleepy Congress of the 1950s and early 1960s. Not a small task at all. Um, he, by 1951, he had the idea, the outline. If you read the Wilderness Act today, there are seven sections, or there used to be seven sections, one was repealed. Um, he, uh, he had the outline in mind. He was very deliberate in not putting words to paper because he did not want people to say, I want to quibble about the words. So he refused uh, adamantly to put the words to paper. In the 50s, by 1954 or 55, he and Brower were confronted with such a threat to the national integrity of the national park system that they had to shelve the Wilderness Act for a while to see if they could block a dam that was proposed in Dinosaur National Monument, then a very obscure uh, part of the national park system uh, in the northwest uh, corner of Colorado up against the Utah boundary. And nobody knew where this was and cared a fig about it, but right where the Yampa and Green Rivers came together in a place called Echo Park, the Bureau of Reclamation thought it would just be the cat's pajamas to stick a dam. Now this dam, would I think have, des have generated a little electricity, but its real function, its only real political function, was to be one of a series of dams on the upper Colorado River system that were, in essence, I liken them to a series of toilet bowls. The point was to keep the water upstream of Lee's Ferry in Arizona so that the water right, first in right, first in, in uh, anyway, um, 
the water rights would be retained by the upper basin states and would not be uh, uh, slipped down to Arizona and God help us, California. Uh, and uh, they had a rare old fight. One year they'd lose in the Senate, but they'd managed to pour sand in the gears and it's really easy to kill pieces of legislation as you may have observed for the last 31 years. Um, and uh, the next year they would figure out some way to, would pass this house, but they'd figure out some way to stop it in the Senate. And finally the dam builders lost the sense of amusement in this process and they came to, uh, capitulated completely, absolute victory. Uh, and on January 31st of 1956, uh, uh, in an exchange of letters with Howard Zahn, with, uh, between Zahnheiser and the uh, chairman of the House Committee, Wayne Aspinall of Colorado, the leader of the dam builders, they agreed that there would be no dam at Echo Park. And uh, that was a seminal moment because it was the proving ground, it was the learning, the training wheels for Brower and Zahnheiser in how to be effective lobbyists in Congress. And they emerged with this ramped up political set of skills and perceived power, which the perception is often uh, the whole trick. And that uh, led them to be in a position to advocate for uh, the Wilderness Act. And so five days after he signed the letter settling the Echo Park dispute, complete victory, Zani sat down at his dining room table in Hyattsville, Maryland and started the first handwritten draft of the Wilderness Act. It went through 19 drafts before it was introduced on, uh, in June of 1956. It was introduced by the, that liberal's liberal, Hubert Humphrey of Minnesota, who of course had the Boundary Waters Canoe Area, and a deeply conservative Republican congressman from Pennsylvania, John Saylor. Perfect team and importantly, a bipartisan team. Throughout this history, you will hear me say, and it's true right down to today, that the progress for the building of our wilderness system has been the result of bipartisan, uh, bipartisanship on the behalf of the members of Congress. Um, Zani was an old, uh, was a wordsmith. He was a former editor for the government, uh, and uh, he, in drafting the Wilderness Act, he took enormous enormous care. The word untrammeled, which we've heard about several times this morning, the word untrammeled does not meet, mean, as one of the chiefs of the Forest Service said in testimony to Congress, untrampled. There's no P. A trammel in old uh, French, old Latin, is, uh, is a net or a restraint. Sometimes the hobble for a horse is called a trammel. So the idea in the context of the Wilderness Act, a place where the earth and its community of life, the forces of nature, ecology, uh, ecosystem change, are left unrestrained by man. It, when he was redrafting the bill for a reintroduction in, uh, in uh, 1959, a bunch of people ran a little, three people, ran a little, uh, friends of his, ran a little grassroots letter writing campaign on Sani, and they said, for God's sake, get rid of that word untrammeled. No one knows what it means. It's not in common usage, it's going out of the language. And if you mean undisturbed, say undisturbed. And Zani wrote back, so we know what he meant. He said, I don't mean undisturbed. I mean an area where the community of Earth and its community of life are unimpeded, unrestrained, unnetted, unhobbled by man. And uh, in the face of global climate change, as we talked about uh, also this morning, that is an enormously important uh, consideration. Uh, the Wilderness Act, from the day it was introduced in June of 1956, took eight years to pass the Congress, despite the fact that they'd taken enormous care to take care of the interests of everyone involved, except the miners. Livestock grazing could continue where it already existed, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the water provision that Chris Barnes talked about today, the, st the state control of fish and wildlife, all of those things were meant to minimize opposition to no effect whatsoever. The opponents just were, un and the opponents included, again, just the leaders, the director of the National Park Service who hated the Wilderness Act and the chief of the Forest Service, ditto. Their passion, op, passionate opposition 
was, and I use the term bureaucrat lovingly, was premised on the proposition that they, no bureaucrat wants to give up an inch of their administrative discretion. But the whole point of the Wilderness Act was to take away virtually all of the discretion, except over some management details, so that uh, the uh, wilderness, uh, uh, in particular, the wilderness boundaries would stay put. So we come to September 3rd, 1964. It, the, the concessions in Congress that finally were made, the accommodations, were not, as somebody said this morning, really compromises. They were simply, Wayne Aspinall said, I will not allow this bill to reach the House floor from my committee, and he had that power, without your coming to terms with my, uh, with my uh, demand. And his principal demands were that mining be continued for a period of time, it ended up being 19 years, and no mining occurred in any wilderness area. After all, those old Forest Service wilderness areas, which were the original ones under the Wilderness Act, were up in places that were chosen because they were places that didn't have any minerals worth getting at. Nobody wanted to build the roads, uh, and uh, uh, just didn't happen. Um, the, so, uh, and the other demand that Aspinall had, and bear in mind, it had taken eight years to get this bill to the president's desk, but Aspinall said, I will require that every new wilderness area be designated by a new act of Congress. You can package some together, but it would take a new act of Congress. And, you know, the wilderness advocate said, oh my God, you know, we just have spent eight years on this turkey, uh, and if we have to do that for every little wilderness area, we're going to be, uh, we're never going to get this done. But Aspinall was adamant. The single best thing that ever happened in this history. Because under the scheme that Zani had drafted and that had passed the Senate twice, wilderness, area bound, wilderness areas were proposed and studies were done by the agencies. They gurgled up through the bureaucracy to the secretary of the department and then popped over to the president. They could get changed. And had this been the way it ended up, we'd have gone in and spent our time lobbying to get them improved. But once they went to Congress, they could not be altered. It was a yes or no vote. And the only way to, uh, to defeat uh, that presidential proposal was by what was called a, a legislative veto or a congressional veto. Harken back to your high school civics. That's not the way it works. Presidents veto legislation, not the other way around. And a few years later, under a, in a completely different context, the Supreme Court found that whole thing unconstitutional. But the real point of the importance of each area taking an act of Congress, however long it takes, and it takes, as I don't need to explain to Montanans and Idahoans, it takes forever, sometimes, or seemingly. It's worth all the trouble for two reasons. First of all, you can alter the boundaries. And in the average wilderness, case of wilderness bills, we do alter the boundaries, making them larger. It's happened over and over and over again, including all over Montana, uh, with the uh, designation of wilderness areas. Uh, my favorite example is the Ventana Wilderness in coastal California, so south of Monterey. It's been expanded five times. And we're just in the process of expanding. And again, the district ranger says, I don't have any more. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but that illustrates an important point that the wilderness movement has been very astute in understanding that we sh we're incrementalists. We need to take what we can get, put it in the bank, and then we can focus all our resources on the next chunk. It would be great if uh, Phil's uh, Scotchman Peaks wilderness could pass in both Idaho and Montana at the same time, and with a little luck it will. But if it doesn't, they'll take whichever half does pass, because then they can concentrate on the other half. Uh, well, Willard's Act was signed in the Rose Garden at uh, 1020 in the afternoon of, or in the morning of, uh, I just got the president's log for that day of how he spent the day. Um, some of it he spent on Vietnam, uh, lamentably. Uh, but uh, he signed the Wilderness Act. And at that instant, 53, 
54 areas in the National Forest became the first wilderness areas. Some terrific precedents involved there, because it included, for example, three areas in the east, and I'll come back to them. And the, uh, uh, it made the line stay put. And if you want to broil the Wilderness Act down and boil out all the fat and get right down to the essence, that's it. Took me a long time to kind of come to grips with that fact. It's about making the boundary lines stay put. Once a boundary is enacted, it's a, part, it's a map referenced in the legislation itself, so it's part of the law, only Congress can change it. And that's by only an, so much as an inch. That's the power of this law. Uh, Chris uh, Barnes spoke about the one that uh, was passed one year that took out 200 acres. That's the largest I know of. Well, there was one in New Hampshire that, or Vermont that involved a guy's house and farm, and he didn't take it kindly that he was put in the wilderness, so that was 2,600 acres, I think, in that case. Um, the Wilderness Act required the study of uh, a goodly number of 34 Forest Service primitive areas, including some here in, the, in Montana, uh, and all roadless areas of 5,000 acres or larger in the National Park System, and all roadless areas of 5,000 acres or larger, and all roadless islands in the National Wildlife Refuge System. And a, under Stuart Udall and President Kennedy, an extraordinary, extraordinarily clever solicitor of the Interior Department defined island to be either a thing surrounded by water, or something like a plateau or a swamp surrounded by sufficiently distinct uh, uh, geography. Uh, and uh, that, was a good, that day was a good piece of work. Um, at this moment, the Wilderness Society had one office in Denver with one person who didn't have enough money to, uh, to go anywhere. The Sierra Club, had no chapters outside California except in the Pacific Northwest and uh, in the Atlantic chapter, which covered the entire rest of the country, uh, possibly including Montana. Uh, so there simply were no resources out there, yet there were to be these 10-year studies, each requiring a local, at least one, often two, local public hearings, leading to a proposal that would work its way up through the uh, bureaucracy to the president the president sending to the White House, and, uh, to the Congress, and all of those had to reach Congress. The deadline was imposed on the president within 10 years from September 3rd, 1964. And they did make it, ultimately, though they had to strain a little bit. And we put all of our eggs in those years, that was when I came on the scene, in, in ensuring that we got crucial precedents. I said about the three little wilderness areas in the east, one in New Hampshire and two in uh, South Carolina, the Forest Service announced sort of ex cathedra in the early 70s that no, that, again, this was the leaders, that no area um, which had ever felt the impact of the imprint of man's works could be designated as wilderness, that it had to be, somebody talked this, out, this morning about pristine, these areas had to be as pure as the driven snow. Um, and uh, Wilderness Act doesn't say any such thing at all. And the beauty of those three areas in the, uh, in the east, particularly one in North Carolina called the Shining Rock Wilderness, which you could still hear the echo in the old Wilderness Society headquarters when I dug around in the files and found the Forest Service regional offices correspondence in, or press release in which they said that in order to obtain a desirable boundary on the ridge top, they would, they would uh, close out, complete a timber sale, and scarify the roads and wrap up the roads <laughs> in a place called Ugly Creek. I mean, you couldn't make this up. Uh, and I have been to Ugly Creek, and it's a perfectly wonderful spot. The Forest Service was just adamant about this, and finally, we invented, I drafted a bill called the Eastern Wilderness Areas Act of 1975, which was a message bill. The idea was at congressional hearings, we got just the right sponsors, people who'd been involved with the Wilderness Act itself, and the whole scheme was that at hearings, we'd get the chief of the Forest Service up there and beat him up around the head and shoulders and say, wait a second, where did you get the idea that that purity thing is part of the Wilderness Act? And, because it isn't. And it would be these highly credible people, Frank Church in particular, who was the 
the uh, floor manager for the Wilderness Act both times that it passed the, uh, that it passed the U.S. Senate, uh, who just said, that's wrong. And at that hearing, I didn't have to go whisper in church's ear. He knew. He, uh, he said, wait a second, chief. I get it. You don't care about these little wilderness areas in the east that have had human impacts. You're worried that if we establish that definition as the definition in the Wilderness Act, it'll mean that all those areas in the west that are down below timberline that have felt the impendent man's work will become uh, available for, uh, for wilderness designation. He said, don't worry your pretty little head about that. You bring up your proposals. We always give high, are highly respectful of your proposals. Very often we adopt them. We may change them. But that's our job. Your job is to do the studies and, and make your own recommendations. And, and uh, Senator Haskell of Colorado, another great guy, said, I believe the cat just got out of the bag. <laughs> it was a wonderful moment. The other thing that they got into, including here in Montana, uh, was uh, they would take one large roadless area. This was the story of the Gospel Hump Wilderness, and subdivide it into a whole bunch of little pieces, uh, such that, uh, and then they'd study those. And they say, "Oh, there's no wilderness values there. That's only you know 400 acres." They say, "Wait a second. There's a quarter of a million acres here, and if you actually, if you connect it down the, uh, up the river a little ways, it connects to the Frank Church River of No Return Wilderness, the old Idaho primitive area. And the whole damn thing has to be studied as one single unit. And they were just aghast at that proposition, but uh, so we did another message bill called the Endangered American Wilderness Act. I cooked that up, uh, including the title, there was absolutely nothing endangered about any of the, any of the areas, included Welcome Creek here in Montana. Uh, they were chosen, all from western states, they were chosen to exemplify this problem. Again, at hearings, the Forest Service got excoriated for the troubles that they were causing. Well, things took a more positive turn after that. The Forest Service got with the program on those two points. And in uh, 1976, we greatly expanded the potential size of the wilderness system when Section 603 of the Federal Land Policy and Management Act was enacted. Everyone had envisioned that the wilderness program should include Bureau of Land Management lands back in 64, but it simply wasn't politically plausible to do it then because unlike the Forest Service, there was no limited subset of primitive areas that you could focus on for study. So you would conceivably be requiring study of the entire, and there was no inventory process in those days. You were sort of uh, you, you would be just opening this Pandora's box. And, uh, but by 1976, as a result of a recommendation made by the Public Land Law Review Commission, chaired by Wayne Aspinall, who said, this is just nuts. This uh, just the logical part of the program. And they cooked up, as Chris described this morning, the uh, provisions in Section 603 that identified a bunch of wilderness study areas. And now today, with a little nudge from the courts, uh, but also some terrific work by both the agency, the BLM, and citizen uh, conservationists. They're doing really good work in inventorying and, and considering for study, and uh, stronger than even the old primitive areas. Uh, once an area, all, and all the primitive areas have been designated, except one, the Arizona portion of the Blue Range primitive area has not been designated. Um, the uh, these BLM areas are protected as, once they're made a wilderness study area, they're protected as wilderness till Congress determines otherwise, which in some of those states, Wyoming comes to mind, will be some time uh, in coming. Uh, so Aspinall's legacy of the requiring an act of Congress and thereby opening the door to the expansion of the wilderness areas is terribly important. What about the future? Today we are looking at, in the Congress at well over two million acres of pending wilderness legislation, including John Tester's bill, including uh, important areas across the, uh, across the country, uh, conceivably the Boulder White Clouds uh, legislation uh, yet to be introduced. Uh, might be as much as four million acres. Uh, Senator Harry Reid in Nevada has a big chunk. He's already got one chunk but he's got another big chunk that he's considering. And his practice in recent years, 
we have to hope the Democrats hold, this is a partisan remark, um, so you can take it or leave it, but uh, I'll take it. We have to hope that he continues to be the majority leader next year, because his practice to, is to take all the bills that have been introduced, some by Republicans, some by uh, Democrats, some by a combination, just depending on the state and the district, and put those in a single package, which has the great advantage of being um, uh, linked to uh, having all that bipartisan support behind one thing. He very often, as he did in 2008, 2009, will then adhere that to uh, some larger package of public land or any other must-pass bill, and the whole thing sweeps through. He is not particular about whether the House has passed a bill, and he's not particular about whether both senators from a state, Montana comes to mind, um, again, uh, will, uh, will, be, uh, will be involved. Uh, that would only apply, of course, in the unhappy future with uh, Senator Daines. You got to do better, folks. So between two and four million acres in uh, conceivably this year, if they don't pass, or most of them don't, we'll just still be there knocking at the door. Uh, and uh, uh, because we have taken care to train and encourage grassroots people all over the country, and I do mean all over the country, to be persistent, to say, well, if we don't make it, we're just going to get back and broaden our coalition. We're going to go find the, the, the uh, cook and the bottle washer and the, and the candle maker, and we're going to broaden our coalition and build even greater support for this, uh, for this proposed wilderness. How big will our wilderness system be in the final analysis? Your bet's as good as mine, but I'm pulling for way in, advance, in, in excess of 300 million acres. Not in my lifetime, not in my daughter's lifetime, um, but it'll be very large. Now, you can imagine that there will come an end to the designation of wilderness. I know that the last acre, Congress will reach its belly full and the last acre will be designated. I know two things about that last acre. One, it will be a long, long time from now. And two, there'll still be somebody mobilizing to try and get another acre added, and maybe they will, and then uh, it'll be that much farther into the future. The dilemma is that however much we preserve, we may not preserve enough. I like to say that uh, the future generations may well judge, you can imagine, that we preserve too much wilderness. In which case, they have the power in their hands to take care of that. But I think it's far more likely that they will say, those dolts didn't preserve enough for us and we get or better get with the program. Think of the world they're going to live in, you young people, and your children and your grandchildren. Far more crowded, far noisier, despite every good intention, um, population growth, climate change, all those evils that we've heard about, um, wilderness will be so much more valuable to those folks, people we will not know, as a solace, as a place to get beyond the roar of the engine and the clank of the machinery and to find the spiritual uh, sustenance um, and uh, terribly important. Which brings us to the importance of, protect, of the stewardship of wilderness areas. And here I have to salute the Chris Barneses of the world and the, and the other fine agency folks, thousands of whom now are advocates for the designation of wilderness area, many of whom have joined the new organization headquartered here in uh, Montana, the, uh, the uh, Society for Wilderness Stewardship, uh, which is a very important uh, component of the, uh, of the overall structure for the future of wilderness. Many of them will be volunteers working with agency folks who simply don't have enough personnel. Your chances of going out on a trail anywhere and ever running into a forest ranger are just zilch in a wilderness area. What you might run into, increasingly, are wilderness stewards. Young folks, old folks, retirees, who have taken training with the Forest Service and are out on the trail to do uh, light trail maintenance, 
trail, um, uh, you know, using cross, if they've been properly trained, using cross cuts saws safely to take down uh, uh, deadfalls over the trails. Um, campsite and uh, visitor monitoring and uh, trailhead visitor uh, contact of one sort or another. Um, a very important work. I chair the board of the Wilderness Land Trust, and young fellow who's a graduate student here, Andis Adams, is a member of our board, uh, recently moved here from Sitka, Alaska. Uh, and uh, we exist to encourage and plant new, existing and new volunteer groups to help all the agencies, with a particular emphasis so far on the Forest Service, which helped us get going, uh, to uh, provide that kind of stewardship service in, uh, in wilderness areas. I serve on the board of another, uh, of another uh, nonprofit, the Wilderness Land Trust, which plays an extraordinarily important role. The wilderness system contains many areas that are privately or state owned all over the country. Uh, and uh, these uh, are least potentially threatened with development because if you own a private inholding and you ever can prove that there was ever an historic road access, you can reestablish that road access uh, and uh, you don't come build a cabin or whatever you like on it. And uh, the uh, Wilderness Land Trust acts as the realtor to the wilderness system absolutely on a win-win basis. We want the landowner to go away with just as happy a feeling as we have. So we knock on their door or write them a letter and say, did you know that Aunt Tilly used to own or did own this and so you now own this uh, 160 uh, acre chunk in the middle of the Podunk Falls wilderness area and uh, we'd like to take it off your hands at a government appraised price, Forest Service or whichever agency has to agree on the price. Uh, we've done some of these transactions with the BLM, we've done some of these, we're just doing one in the Ventana wilderness momentarily. Um, it's fourth or fifth one we've done there. Um, and. Uh, when I joined the board, I made it a condition that the Wilderness Land Trust not only works in designated wilderness, but we work in proposed wilderness areas. So any uh, agency or, or uh, you know, reputable citizen proposed, like MWA or, or others, uh, wilderness area, we, uh, we stand to come in and help deal with the potential threat. The wilderness system is not immune to threats. And Zonizer, you go back again to this man's genius, not a word I use lightly, he, in drafting the provision of the Wilderness Act in Section 4C that says that there's to be no use of motor vehicles, motorized equipment, or any other form of mechanized transport. Now, mechanized is a bigger word, bigger category than motorized. And some of the idiot wing about three of them, of the mountain biking community, uh, completely ignored by their brethren, uh, tried to make the proposition that the Wilderness Act, the authors never intended for, the, for that to include uh, uh, areas of, uh, of uh, uh, where there were mountain bikes. One of these people said to me, there's, there's, first of all, that was never the intent of the law. And I said, well, you're just blowing smoke. And he said, well, you can't demonstrate that the thinkers and the founders and people that gave us the concept of wilderness ever thought of this. And I took that as a little challenge. And I got it back to 1892, when one of the founders of the Wilderness Society and the father of the Appalachian Trail, Benton Mackay, and a Harvard student buddy of his, set out from the suburbs of north of, Chicago, of Boston to go backpacking in the White Mountain National Forest. Think of the roads. Think of the bicycles. They must have spent weeks pumping up and patching tires. But anyway, they got to this inn on the edge of what is now but was not then, the White Mountain National Forest. And in his journal that night, Benton wrote, tomorrow my first real wilderness. We leave the bicycles behind. You gotta love it. Well, what of the future? Maybe 300 plus million acres, I think so. The key to it, I started with it, is that passion, the audacity. The other day, uh, 
uh, late August, the president signed uh, his uh, annual proclamation making September Wilderness Month. And in one of the clauses, he said, uh, he used the word audacity, which, as I recall, is an Obama favorite word. Uh, and uh, it's audacious to consider that, that we're working to preserve areas that will be preserved in perpetuity. A perpetuity is a big word. It doesn't mean, well, it sort of means forever, but it sure doesn't mean, you know, for a few generations. It means forever. And it doesn't mean forever just for us. More importantly, it means forever for the grizzlies and the salmon and the salamanders and the mosquitoes <laughs> um, and the biting flies and the rabbits and the, you know, everything that creeps and crawls. In this work, nobody is more important than you young people. We'll cut you off at 29 or 42 or 86, some number like that. Uh, because you carry, the, you carry the torch. And if you don't absorb, that's why I wrote the book, it's for you, The Enduring Wilderness, get a hold of it. If you don't absorb these lessons, we will be fated to repeat the mistakes of the past. We'll start thinking that these areas have to be pure. Pardon me, Chris, but we'll start thinking that the boundaries have to be set way back from the edges of roads. They don't. They aren't. Um, sometimes there's a good reason to do that, but my favorite, Chris Roholt, a friend of mine is here who worked on the California desert portion of wilderness law. There's a wilderness area down there, and its boundary is the boundary fence that you see along the freeway. Interstate 10 that goes between Las Vegas and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Los Angeles. And at one point, there's one of those truck runout things for trucks that lose their brakes, and the boundary just jogs up and across. I was joking with Chris that there may be a case where, uh, where uh, the cab of a truck runs out into the wilderness, and then we'll have to cite the guy and haul him in to, before the magistrate, and all that stuff. It takes courage to work for wilderness. It takes persistence. And I, if you all remember from high school, uh, the laws of, two laws of thermodynamics, I have Scott's two laws of wilderness politics. And the first is, you're winning until you lose. Now, you can take hope from that. Anybody can. But the second law, Scott's second law of wilderness politics is you're losing until you win. So get with it, you know, don't stint yourself, get on with it. Go get the cook and the bottle washer and the candlestick maker and get that coalition going. Go find the kids, get the grade school kids and, you know, children have a natural affinity for nature until we beat it out of them. Uh, and, uh, you know, plug them into all these electronic devices and never find them, you know, never find their way back to nature again if we aren't careful. In all of this, humility is so fundamentally important. I want to read you some words. I've avoided this, but I want to read you some words of Howard Zonizer. He said that working to preserve in perpetuity is a great inspiration. We are not fighting a rear guard action. We're facing a frontier. We're not slowing down a force that inevitably will destroy all the wilderness there is. We are generating another force, never to be wholly spent, that renewed generation after generation will always be effective in preserving wilderness. We're not fighting progress, we're making it. We're not dealing with a vanishing wilderness, we're working for wilderness forever. In this work, I sometimes think that all these years I've spent doing this stuff, and God, what a privilege to fall, to fall into this this avocation and uh, devotion, that I wasn't really working to save wilderness at all. Forget the acreage counts. But what I was doing was working to fight cynicism. Cynicism is deeply, dangerously, deadly corrosive to not just wilderness politics, but to the politics of our country as a whole. It's what brought Barack Obama to the White House, that he he beat the cynicism out of young people who got the audacity of hope. 
and took the courage to go knock on doors, which nobody ever enjoys doing. Um, that cynicism is taught to us, especially our young people, every day on television, on social media. It's just, it's just pervasive. We, we bow to it at our peril for our politics in general and for our society as a whole and for the future of our wilderness system. So join me, please, in getting your hands on some young person. Zach, are you paying attention back there? And getting them out into the wilderness and getting them engaged. You get that person to write a letter, and you teach them how to write an effective letter, always longhand, never canned, never an email. Go befriend the receptionist, the most important person in your senator or congressman's district office. Get them to fax that letter to the key staff person in Washington, D.C. Single most important kind of communication you can do, short of calling a member of Congress. Doris Milner, whose name has been raised here more than once, used to call Lee Metcalf regularly. I was standing there, and she'd say, now, Lee, here's what you're going to do. <laughs> and, and Lee would say, yes, Doris, <laughs> and, and march right off and, uh, and uh, carry, carry on. Um, this is just, and once you're captured, by the fact that one person can make a difference, then you can transfer that to any issue you care about, war and peace, poverty, world hunger, all these things that are issues of such moment to our young people today. But it starts with not falling for the proposition that you can't make a difference, that you can't know your member of Congress firsthand, that they're all just bought and sold and corrupt, not true. There's three or four of them that are complete jerks. They usually don't last too long. Uh, there's the odd drunkard. There's three or four that are sold out. Um, but the vast percentage of members of Congress are public servants who could make a lot more money and live a much happier life not having to fly back and forth from Montana every week. And this applies to the most Tea Party-ish people who will surprise you the most recent edition of the wilderness system was in March of this year in Michigan in the Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore, 32,577 acres, and it was uh, 22 years in the coming from the time Congress required the study, um, and it was the park superintendent who made it her business to figure out how to get the Congress to uh, designate that area, sponsored by two of the most liberal senators in, in Washington and a deeply far right of Tea Party Republican, Congressman Benichek, who announced quite candidly to his credit that he needed to green up for his reelection. I'll take it, 32,577 acres in the bag. Not everything I want, it was my training wheels when I was in grad school was the, was the original authorization of that wilderness area. So join me please in fighting cynicism and we have a minute or two here, so if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take them. And maybe the microphone would reappear. If, I, if however... <laughs> if, however, I've stunned you into silence, uh, that's okay, too, because I'll be back, I'll be back uh, momentarily. Any questions? Oh, come on. You want to argue with me about buffer zones, Chris? <laughs> all right, thank you all very much.